Hi everybody and welcome back. In this chapter we're going to do a brief review of the police and their functions within the criminal justice system. Uh, chapter 5 really shows you a history of the police, but in this chapter we focus more on the modern role that police play in our social structure. So let's begin. So if we look at police in America, we need to recognize a few things. Even though that we know that the United States prison population is really, hands down, the largest in the world, we still have millions of citizens who never really even have any interactions at all with all aspects of the criminal justice system. For those who never step foot in a jail or even in a courtroom, their main interactions with a legal authority really are going to come from their interactions with police. These interactions might not even result from something that's criminal, as the police really have a variety of different functions that they have to engage in on a daily basis. But our interactions with the police really depend on who we are as individuals. We know that white individuals and those from middle and really upper classes are more likely to view the police as a resource and as a helping aid. However, when someone needs assistance, the police can provide that for those specific people. But if you are one of, if you are from a minority group, someone of low socioeconomic background, or even someone from a high crime area, uh, research really shows that you are more likely to feel resistance towards the police and not view them as an aid at all, but rather as an enemy. So if we continue looking at the roles on police, we need to continue looking at the differences that take place. So building on the differences that we just observed in the last slide, we really know that not everybody views the roles of the police in the same way. This is really based on a few different factors. What is the actual role of the police? What is it that they're supposed to be doing for us? This focuses on the rights and responsibilities associated with being a police officer to begin with. Their function is really to arrest folks, give them tickets to protect, investigate specific crimes, etc. So if we look at roles in that regard, everybody might come to it thinking something different based on their own experiences. If I am somebody who is a high-speed driver, I might not like the police because I am someone who have, has gotten multiple t tickets and citations in the past. That's comparative to somebody who doesn't drive the way that I do. They might not view the police in the same way. So how does this differ from our role expectations of the police? This really focuses on the behavior and the actions that people expect from police as authority figures. Finally, how does this culminate in the role conflict between our expectations of the police and their actual roles within their job? In other words, this is the psychological stress and really fr frustration that results from trying to perform two or more incompatible responsibilities. So I think if I think that the police are supposed to only be there to arrest and investigate and that they shouldn't be giving people tickets, my expectation is much different than the reality of the total encompassing function that police officers play in our criminal justice system. So let's now look at this specific table that comes from your textbook. Table 6.1 shows the variety of things that police officers have to respond to on a daily basis. There's a lot of different functions and they're constantly being called away for something um, that might be criminal or something that just might be a helping sort of function. There's really, if you look at this table, a high level of danger associated with the job all over the place. While responding to many of these instances, police officers are often assaulted and injured in the line of duty. This table shows the prevalence of assault based on the type of call that they are responding to. You'll note that police are most frequently assaulted while responding, re, while responding to disturbance calls. So the top kind of categories here, we see that roughly 33.3% of all assaults on police officers come from these disturbance calls. Let's next look at the operational styles of police officers. A number of scholars have tried to categorize policing styles. In practice, it is difficult to categorize police officers in total because each officer reacts differently depending on the situation. Research shows that the police do not have a monolithic culture 
and that police officers in the same department can possess significantly different attitudes towards their work comparative to other officers. However, one of the earliest typologies was developed by James Wilson. He was the theorist who developed broken windows theory. He divided police officer behavior into three categories. So let's explore those. The first is the legalistic type of culture. This focuses on an emphasis on violations of law and the use of threats or actual arrests to, dis to solve disputes. This type of officer is more likely to make arrests and issue tickets and citations. This is a visible solution to the issue taking place. So if a fight breaks out in a local bar, the officer will simply arrest the individuals in play rather than trying to find the cause of the fight and peacefully disband it. This is more of a reactive style to policing. The second category is the watchman style officer. This focuses on an emphasis on informal means of resolving disputes and problems within the community. With the watchman style of policing, if the officer see the, sees the same fight at the same bar, then he or she is more likely to try and get the parties to explain why they are fighting in the first place, how the argument can be resolved without anybody having to be arrested. This is still sort of a reactive form of police behavior, but is much different from the legalistic view that other officers take part in. And finally, we have the service style of law enforcement officer. This focuses on an emphasis on helping the community as opposed to enforcing the law. So this is something that you would find more often with community, uh, community policing officers. With service-oriented police officers, they're invested in the communities that they serve. So instead of waiting for the fight to take place, they're interested in trying to dissolve, diffuse tensions ahead of time. This is a proactive style of policing that intends for the violence to be disrupted before it even begins. So let's focus more on the, on the functions of police. Just like any company, all of the employees have to serve different functions. Not everyone can perform the same task. Most police departments operate in the same structure, but, the, but these structures are dependent on needs and locations and might have slight differences included in all aspects of the police department. Large urban areas might need bike police and more police patrolling on foot. More rural areas might need mounted officers or officers who patrol in all-terrain vehicles given the location of their jurisdictions. Port cities might need larger vice units to deal with high volumes of drug crimes, prostitution, and sex trafficking that occur there. However, no matter where you are, the most important function of officers is their ability to patrol. Having a police presence on the streets in the community can deter potential offenders and also allows for citizens to feel safer when they see the police nearby. Those officers who patrol the streets have certain duties which include first responding to burglar alarms, investigating traffic accidents, caring for injured people, trying to dissolve domestic disputes, and responding to radio calls among other duties. You can see why this job is time consuming and very dangerous for those who work patrol beats. Tradi if, if the officers are not responding to a specific event, such as a car accident or a burglary, they're riding around looking for crime. They're looking for traffic violations, they're scanning license plates, they're looking at businesses, people working, walking on the sidewalk, and whatever else to make sure that they can detect crime as it occurs. This is both a preventative and reactive police function. Pulling over someone who runs a red light is a reactive function of, patr function of patrol but looking for potential offenders is more of a preventative function. They do this in a random way rather than allowing for individuals to detect a pattern. So each day they will take different streets and work those streets in a different order in order for offenders to not be able to detect such a pattern. Directed patrol, on the other hand, focuses on spending more time on problem areas. For example, if there had recently been a string of sexual assaults in certain areas of town, then there may be an increased police presence on those specific streets in order to deter the specific offender and to try and find that individual. 
Most times, both types of patrol are still taking place simultaneously by different officers to cover as, most, as much ground as possible. Let's now look at the function of crime mapping. Directed patrol is related to the function of crime mapping. Police departments now have the ability to plot out locations of crimes that have occurred to see if there are patterns and area of high occurrence. This is through the use of geographic information systems. This is a crime map of the greater Los Angeles area. The red areas indicate higher crime rates, whereas the blue areas indicate lower crime rates. The red areas clustered together are known as hotspots. You will see more of a police presence in these hotspots than you will in other areas. If you are interested in learning about GIS and crime mapping, UT Tyler offers these types of classes for you to be able to learn about these techniques, and through those classes they will show you how to use the software that develops these maps. These can be taken through the criminal justice system. This is another view of a GIS crime map. This is the city of Atlanta. You'll notice that the closer that you get to a, the center of a major metropolis or the downtown area, the higher the crime rates tend to be. South, south and east of Atlanta, you'll also see hot spots. There are less affluent areas, and we know that more crime tends to take place in areas with lower socioeconomic standards compared to areas like North Atlanta where there is a higher SES demographic. When we have these areas of concentrated crime, typically police departments increase the amount of foot patrol that they deploy there. Foot patrol is the earliest and most recognizable form of police patrol. Large cities relied on having officers on foot. It made the officers more approachable, they were able to investigate their suspicions easier, and it proved to be a deterrent. As patrol cars became the norm, there were less officers patrolling on foot, but we now are seeing an increase in the amount of foot patrols occurring once more. This table does an excellent job of showing the breakdown of different patrol styles. You'll notice in this table that the areas with larger populations tend to use a variety of patrol styles more often than smaller populations. Some jurisdictions don't have transporter, horse, or air patrols at all because there's simply not a need given the small space that the officers are patrolling. So let's look at criminal investigation. Police also have to investigate crimes once they detect that they have occurred. Police officers are involved in a variety of actions during an investigation. Those actions include location of witnesses and suspects, arresting criminals, collecting, preserving, and analyzing evidence. They also have to interview witnesses, interrogate suspects, write reports about their investigations, recover stolen property, they have to seize contraband, and they have to prepare cases and testify in court. You can tell that the police have a lot going on. Detectives may lead investigations, but patrol officers also serve as support for these detectives. The criminal investigation process really has two parts. First, the preliminary investigation takes, takes place. This is usually completed by patrol officers, except in the case of homicides or in rather Complex, complex investigations. Secondly, there's the follow-up investigation. This is usually conducted by plainclothes detectives. Let's focus on the role of the detective, since he or she is the one who is doing most of the investigative work. Many patrol officers strive to move up the ranks to become a detective. Detectives are involved in investigating crimes, as we had already stated, and have to juggle a lot of different actions all at once. Detectives may only work specific crimes such as homicides or sexual assaults. They are specialized in those areas and know how to look for specific pieces of evidence that will help solve the murder or the sexual assault. There are many perks to being a detective, such as having your own office and having more steady work hours compared to patrol officers. They also have the benefit of not having to wear a uniform and they are not as easily identified as a police officer by potential suspects. 
These things make their job easier, but there are a lot of cons to the job as well. Despite the advantages of being a detective, detectives often face insurmountable obstacles and stressful work conditions. Crimes can be very difficult to solve, and investigations can sometimes take weeks or months or never come to a resolution. Witnesses who could help often don't want to be involved. This makes the investigation process that much more difficult. And finally, even with very hard work, the success rate can be very low. Sometimes the suspect is never found. Sometimes the case goes cold, and this results in an unsolved investigation for the detective in question. I now want to turn and look to some, some specific agencies, such as those that handle drug enforcement. For example, the DEA or Drug Enforcement Agency focuses on uncovering drug trafficking operations, which, increase, which include the production and distribution of large amounts of drugs. Of course, drug sales do not always occur in large-scale amounts of legal, illegal substances, so there is concern at every level. When we talk about federal agencies like the DEA, we have to note that they are most interested in high volume production and distribution. It is not worth it for, federal gov for the federal government to go after simple ba dime bag users of marijuana. However, if those dime bag users are buying from specific sellers who are tied to a large trafficking operation, then maybe they would be useful to the DEA as informants. The higher you go in the level of government agency, the more, important, the more importance is placed on larger crimes that are worth their while. Drugs have always played a large role in American culture for decades. So has the pr prosecution of such substances beginning as early as the 1930s with Aislinger's War on Marijuana and more notably with the re more recent creation of the drug on wars in the 1970s by President Nixon. This does not stop Americans from using illicit substances, though. This table shows how many individuals have used illegal substances over the course of their lives. As you can see, marijuana continues to be one of the more popular drugs, comparative to other, more hard drugs. Crack cocaine t continues to decline as other drugs like hallucinogens and inhalants, something that could be as simple as glue or spray paint, continue to increase in popularity. With that, much drug use still taking place in our culture, it is clear that the DEA and other drug officers are keeping busy through the detection and prosecution of such crimes. As we stated earlier, the DEA is largely interested in high-level drug crimes, but drug crimes happen at all levels, large and small. So while the DEA might not be focusing on street-level enforcement like patrol officers are, the DEA is involved in things like crop eradication and smuggling interdiction. You can see this on the news sometimes, that a marijuana crop has been discovered and the DEA has come in to eradicate the plants. People try to grow marijuana everywhere, but larger crops are grown mostly in the desert, in the woods, or other places where there are not a lot of people in order to avoid detection. Or you will see individuals gut houses and grow large crops in a grow house through hydroponic means. Grow houses are often detected by the electricity bill or through the lack of a high electricity bill. Many growers will splice into their neighbor's electricity lines in order to cut down on their own electric bills to avoid detection, but they are still caught a majority of the time. No matter where the crops are found, the agents will cut the plants, gather them up like this agent has done in the picture, and they will burn everything in a giant pile fire. President Nixon coined the term war on drugs in 1971, but it would take more than a decade for the war to really hit its stride. Many people often forget that Nixon really started the movement and instead credit Pre President Reagan for the entire process because many of the laws that were passed were passed during his administration. In 1982, President Reagan announced that drugs were a threat to U.S. national security. The Reagan administration pushed hard on the anti-drug agenda and made nationwide tours to warn about the dangers of illicit drugs. Former First Lady Nancy Reagan was the one to come up with the slogan, Just Say No, and elaborated on this during her campaign stops at elementary schools. 
Thanks to the war on drugs, the government established prevention programs such as DARE, which have been proven to be completely ineffective in drug use prevention. Instead, research shows that DARE, that children who go through DARE programs often report an increase in drug use among these specific populations. Despite the intentions of the new drug laws, the war on drugs ended up incarcerating a lot of young men and a lot of minorities for crack cocaine use. This brings into play the criticism that the war on drugs is racist. Although other drugs were being prosecuted as well, they were not prosecuted nearly as harshly or as diligently as crack cocaine was, since it was a drug that was easy to obtain and often very cheap in price. Although crack and powder cocaine have nearly identical chemical compositions, crack cocaine charges, crack cocaine charges resulted in longer prison sentences than its counterpart part of powder cocaine. Although the sentencing laws have since been changed and the ratio has been reduced, for decades, defendants were sentenced to similar prison sentences for one gram of crack cocaine or 100 grams of powder cocaine. Does this ratio really seem fair? To end the lecture, I want to switch gears a little bit and discuss the importance of community policing. Traditional policing has been more reactive in nature rather than proactive, and that can be seen through the use of the professional model. An officer who is on patrol sees a crime occur and he reacts. That reaction may end, end in a ticket or an arrest, and then the officer finishes the investigation and passes the ev evidence along to the prosecutor if need be. For years, that was the role and function of a professional model police officer. But in the theory of broken windows, James Wilson and George Kelling proposed that if the signs of crime were not taken care of, more serious and more costly crime problems were likely to occur. Wilson and Kelling concluded that to help solve the crime problem in a neighborhood and to reduce the fear of crime, police officers must be in close, regular contact with citizens and thus began the idea of community policing. If police officers are not strangers, then community members, in theory, would be more willing to work with the officers to keep their communities safe. So if there is a drug problem in the community, then citizens would feel more comfortable calling and working with police officers to ident identify those individuals who are bringing drugs into their neighborhoods. It doesn't always work that way. That's why we call it a theory especially if you are in an area that is trustful, distrustful of police to begin with. But the theory would suggest that these are areas that would benefit from community policing the most. In order to establish that trust between police and citizens, the police cannot be a combative presence in the community and have to show citizens that they are on the same side. This means that the police have to be proactive in forming relationships over time. Police officers have to be active in the service aspect of the job. That means that they have to talk to local business owners, visit residents in their home, have neighbors to have and support neighborhood watch groups, and have ongoing communication with their residents. This is not something that can be done overnight or through a one-time interaction. The relationship has to be fostered just like any other. The police cannot be working with their own agendas either. In order for the citizens to trust the police, they have to work with com community members. The police need to address the concerns of the citizens to make them feel as though they are being heard and are being taken seriously. This is done through the SARA process. First we have the S, which stands for scanning. This helps p police officers identify problems. This is done through patrol and with interactions with community members to find out what issues are the most prevalent. Secondly, we have the analysis stage. This focuses on understanding underlying problems. For example, how often or how frequently is this issue taking place? How many people are concerned about a specific type of crime that is occurring within their neighborhoods? Then police have to formulate a response. They have to develop and in implement solutions. So the police have to figure out how are we going to prevent this specific crime from happening in this specific neighborhood. We need to decrease the prevalence of this specific crime and these are the means in which we are going to do it. Finally, we come to the assessment. 
This has to take place in order to determine whether or not the solution was effective. Once the plan is put into effect, it needs to be evaluated to see if it was effective or if something else needs to take its place so that we're not wasting time, money, and other valuable resources. Community policing really requires flexible management styles. If something is not working, maybe it's time to switch to a different method of, of policing to find out what is going to benefit the neighborhood the most. There is also an emphasis on the value of patrol officers. If citizens can see that the officers are taking initiative and making their presence known within communities, then the theory would suggest that they would feel safer and that they'd be more willing and be more open to interacting with police officers. There also has to be a shift in decision making and responsibility downward in the chain of command. Patrol officers have resources to serve, the, serve and solve the community's problems. It's just a matter of maintaining trust and a valuable relationship with those community members that they serve. Successful implementation of community policing requires both that the community and law enforcement understand the underlying philosophy of this method and have a true commitment to the community policing strategy. Although policing is seen as a combative practice in some areas, especially given the current social environment that we find ourselves in, with disputes occurring in Ferguson, Baltimore, and other cities, police officers still serve a specific and important role within the criminal justice system. Their functions are diverse, but interlocking with other officers in the department or agency. Their role often, often inter their role also interconnects with the court and correctional systems as they serve as the first interaction with the criminal justice system as a whole. That's all for that I have for you guys today for this lecture. Meet me up next time when we continue our progress into police styles and their interaction with other members of the correctional and court systems.